Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and we're going to be doing another episode of PNN. So uh, I want to do some short form videos for this series and uh, a longer form dealing with nuclear war. I saw a discussion uh, about a new book that came out about nuclear war, and uh, I think people need to start paying attention uh, to this author and her research on it. Uh, especially as things are starting to ramp up with with Russia, China, what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about this uh, in a pre in some previous videos about the idea of Countdown to Zero, which is a documentary that came out several years ago that I watched. Um, one of the famous uh, tracks on that video is actually from Radiohead, and it's called The Reckoner. So. Um, you know, hopefully you get to see the the documentary if you haven't, but uh, please uh, pay attention to this author because it, it's in the same vein as the documentary. Her work is, is new uh, that she just published. The documentary uh, Countdown to Zero uh, was, I, I believe I, I saw it maybe around, it might have been 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, somewhere in there. So it's, it's been a while. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's start with making sure that you subscribe to all my channels. Make sure that you su subscribe to my three YouTube channels. I have Brighty on BitChute and Rumble. Make sure you subscribe to all six channels. The link is in the description of this video and all of my videos. Also, please follow me on X and on Getter and on Facebook. So you can get notifications, um, get uh, you know updates of what I've been doing. There is censorship that's going on on YouTube. There are some things that I cannot keep up on YouTube, but I will try to premiere, such as talking to people about their experience through the 2020 crisis, all right? And how they have the after effect of, of, of the crisis. So please watch those videos. Also, I did a video with Gail about um, frequencies and how they can affect the body. Um, so please pay attention to that video too. So let's, let's go with CNN. And I wanna give you my commentary on CNN uh, dealing with this particular topic, because I think that they, everywhere I go, everywhere in terms of New York, uh, you know, uh, to different lectures or whatever. It's always orange, orange man bad. Everything in the news that's from MSNBC, CNN, BBC, you know, just everybody is, you know, even the think tanks, orange man bad syndrome. All right. So let's, Let's play CNN and I'll give you my critique on this. A wave of new criticism after sharing a new post to his former president Donald Trump igniting a wave of new criticism after sharing a new post to his followers on Truth Social. The video shows an image of President Joe Biden hogtied on the back of a pickup truck. And now both presidential campaigns are sounding off about the controversy. CNN's Steve Contorno is joining us live with more on all of this. So, Steve, um, what are the responses to this? Well, the Trump campaign is not backing down from this. In fact, in some ways, they're doubling down in a statement that they issued to CNN. A spokesperson for the campaign said, quote, that picture was on the back of a pickup truck that was traveling down the highway. Democrats and crazed lunatics have not only called for despicable violence against President Trump and his family, they are actually weaponizing the justice system against him. And just to describe what was actually in this video, this was captured on Thursday on Long Island. It shows two trucks traveling on the road, uh, decked out in Trump flags and decals. And on the second truck, there is a picture of Joe Biden uh, tied up, hogtied, as you said, uh, and this is the kind of imagery that we have seen from Trump's uh, supporters from time to time at his campaigns, uh, certainly online, and yes, on the back of, of vehicles. It is another thing entirely for the... This was published four hours ago. 
I'm recording this on March 30th at 8.15 p.m. New York time, all right? Where was Biden during the funeral of the officer that was shot? He was with President Clinton and President Obama on stage for a fundraiser, Biden, of about a tune of about $25 million. Where was President Trump? He was at the funeral. All right. So that took place two days ago, right? And they're more worried about someone expressing their their freedom freedom of speech on their truck. Let's continue. A president, a former president, and a someone aspiring to be president once again to amplify that kind of imagery, and that's. The response that we heard from the Biden campaign in a statement to CNN, they said, quote, this image from Donald Trump is the type of crap you post when you're calling for a, quote, bloodbath or when you tell the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. Trump is regularly inciting. First of all, bloodbath in the terms that 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 Trump was saying in the context that he was saying was dealing with economics. And on Bloomberg. They talk about bloodbaths all the time when there's Ill illiquid markets, such as crashes, Lehman, and all that. You don't want to, you, you, you want to, you know what a bloodbath is, you know, in terms of economics? Wait until AI bubble starts to pop, and then there'll be a bloodbath. JP Morgan has been known, was known for saying that he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't get into the market until the, he saw blood on the streets. This is a common phrase in economics, but they spin it in the mainstream media, you know, trunch, Trump deranged syndrome, you know, that orange man, it has to be bad, all right? There wasn't that many mainstream media outlets being negative towards Kathy Griffin when she held the, the decapitated head of Orange Man. Fox did. It's, you know, but they'll have, they'll have Kathy Griffin on The View, you know, saying that she's the victim. violence and it's time people take him seriously just ask the capitol police officers who were attacked protecting our democracy on january 6th and i should mention that of course this is post up capitol police officers so they're you know putting in the context of january 6th what about biden being at the down new york officer it's funeral instead of raising $25 million for his campaign. It doesn't seem like Biden is too, cares too much about the police officer. Social media to his true social uh, accounts come just as he is also receiving flack for these attacks that he is making on the judge and the daughter of the judge who is overseeing uh, the allegations of that he made hush money payments in New York. Joining us right now, former Republican Congressman Joe Walsh of Illinois and Charlie Dent of Pennsylvania. All right, Joe, you first. I mean, I, this is not only irresponsible, I mean, it's downright dangerous. And how can the former president's camp justify that this is mm -hmm. all right? Hey Fred, they, they can't and we can't let them. And this is one of those things where we can't move. I'm voting for Trump, all right? 
You know why? Because there's a lot of crazy liberals that support the Democratic Party that are pushing agendas that are destroying this fucking country. That's why I'm voting for Trump. Where's CNN? Where is CNN with Julia Assange or Snowden? Where they were trying to inform the public about nefarious things that the goddamn national security state has been doing. Crickets. Crickets. They don't say anything. How Julia Assange is detained for so long, even though that he should have had the freedom of the press. CNN doesn't care. You know why? Because it's not CNN, it's CIA. Past the headline. Donald Trump shared an image of the President of the United States tied in the back of a pickup truck, bound and gagged in the back of a pickup truck. I mean, stop there. Yeah, it's inexcusable. No Forget the politics. No, no, no. no. It, it is justifiable. You know why it's justifiable? Because it's a freedom of expression. In addition, in addition, a national security state run amok, running rogue, is, in, is inhibiting your freedoms, your constitutional freedoms. And expanding a national security state, which is elements of the Biopatriot Act. So what the national security state is doing is actually hog-tying the American public. That is the bigger story. This is... So what is ClickUp? ClickUp is an all-in-one productivity software where you can manage everything and anything related to your work, your documents. This is, this is way beyond politics. This is an incitement to violence. But Fred, none of this is surprising. Donald Trump, and this is a scary thing to say because he's the Republican Party nominee, Donald Trump wants there to be violence in this country. He wanted it before January 6th. He wanted what happened on January 6th to happen. Really, Joe Walsh, or whatever the hell your name is. Really? What about BLM? BLM seems to be a pretty violent organization, and the Democratic Party doesn't want to stop that. Seems like the national security state's pretty violent, trying to entrap. American citizens and sending weapons to Ukraine and having never ending fucking war. Seems pretty violent there. He's doing the same damn thing now. And it's right, by the way, for the Biden administration to aggressively go after him. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, why is everybody else incensed about this and not the former president? Yes, he may be speaking to his base. He can count on them. But we are talking about a general election now. I mean, isn't his focus? The national security state, which is run by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, or it's not even run by, it's supported by, let's put it that way. It's supported by the Democratic and Republican Party pushing the Biopatriot Act and all of its elements of it. People need to step up and protect their constitutional freedoms. Do you really think that the Democratic Party is really for you and your household? Really? Are they really for freedom? What about Julia Assange, should I just say? Come on. They've been hog-tying Julia Assange for years.
be that he's trying to grow support? How does this do that? Well, he's really never been about expanding the base of support for his candidacy. I mean, it's that's he only doubles down on uh, the MAGA element of his base. I mean, he hasn't reached out to the Nikki Haley people. He hasn't done any of that. Uh, it's clear to me he doesn't seem to care about uh, broadening the base. What about when they were putting conservative judges during the Trump administration as nominees to be confirmed by the Senate and the crazy ultra liberals were threatening the judges and protesting in front of their home. What about that, CNN? What about that? What about the historical evidence that shows that when there is a Republican president nominating a conservative justice for the Supreme Court, how the ultra liberal tries to do to destroy the reputation compared to a Democrat putting a liberal judge up and how the Republican Party doesn't do that. What about Nancy Waters when she said that you got to go to where they eat and where they, you know, you know, where they congregate and you have to demonize them and ridicule them and protest attack Nancy Waters said to her base attack Republicans and conservatives remember that that said these types of images are are disturbing for a number of reasons because he sends a signal to people across the country that it's okay that it's okay to uh, what about Schumer on the steps of, uh, you know, of the Supreme Court, I believe it was the Supreme Court, maybe it was the steps of, of, of Congress, but I believe it was the Supreme Court, when he was basically saying that because of knocking down abortion rights, that, you know, there needs to be havoc in the streets. And then eventually he had to apologize for that. Trust me, the Democratic Party is very similar to how Mao acted in China. And if you go against them, they're going to attack you. They're going to attack your credibility. They're going to attack your credentials, or they're going to attack your means of commerce. The Democratic Party is anti-constitutional. But these dickheads, they'll just follow you know, along. These, these types of images about the President of the United States. I remember as a member of Congress, I had people who call my office, say they were going to do terrible things to the President, I turn it over to the police and the Secret Service, and these people would be visited. Uh, and it just sends a horrible signal. This is a this is a, a really crass attempt, I think, at, uh, at political humor and negative partisanship. He's trying to converge these two things and not very successfully but that's what he is trying to do and uh, that's just the state of where things are this is just typical for donald trump as joe said he's all about the, uh, this type of incendiary language that has led to violence in the past it's not the first time he's done it and i don't expect it to be the last yeah i mean but you know joe while the biden campaign put out a statement saying i mean this is you know potentially inciting violence uh, i mean uh, trump when you have a president like Biden that states we have to do everything in our power to stop Trump from winning the election. Don't you think that those words are going to create animosity with her, his base? And they wanted that to happen. So they can have dipshit CNN stating that Trump and his followers are a bunch of lunatics. Meanwhile, right after 9-11, now, of course, this happened during a Republican president, George Bush Jr., all right? But meanwhile, right after 9-11, what did we see? You know, a bunch of patriotism and NASCAR. They had a march to war in the Middle East. Did CNN push back? No, no. Did CNN actually in the Gulf War? 
before 9-11, you know, remember Desert Shield and Desert Storm? How they actually lied to the public? Oh, how did they lie to the public, Dr. Paul Patrol, during Desert Shield? CNN lied two ways. They kept on publishing a, a inter, an interview, a hearing in Congress with a story about babies being killed, you know, in, in incubators, which was not true. And then CNN, while they were in Israel, faked some sort of missile launch. And they put gas masks on. Remember that story? Dig it up. It was all fake. He has done when there have been similar, very inappropriate images or things said, will try to make it seem like it's just a joke. You know, where's everybody everybody's humor? And that's another way in which to try to normalize something that is just simply outrageous. It's the sitting president of the United States. What about the normalization of the Democratic Party with the crime that's going on all over America? in major cities like Chicago, LA, New York, Miami, huh? What about the normalization of that? When someone actually steals thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of merchandise and they get off with no bail? And how many cases where we actually hear that that person actually causes a worse crime, like murder? What about CNN normalizing the crassness of BLM? And again, Fred, don't, don't you dare lose that tone of yours. I, I keep that because it is outrageous. And the Biden administration needs to push back every time Trump does this. I disagree with my friend Charlie in one respect. Wait a minute. The American public needs to be outraged on what is being normalized in our inner cities. And the destruction of people's property, the increase of taxes because of the, the, the social problems that are arising, and the quality of life going down. Let's normalize BLM, yeah, and give them reparations. I don't think this is a play to the base. Look, if the election were held next week, it would be neck and neck. It would be damn close. Trump may win electorally. I think Donald Trump believes, I think his team believes that this sort of aggressive, mano mano kind of stuff, fight, 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 play. Joe, you're not getting it. The American public, especially the ones that are voting for Trump or Republican, are fucking sick and tired of how the Democratic Party has destroyed our constitutional freedoms and destroyed our inner cities, destroyed our economics. You know, it was amazing. And I, I'm not going to play the clip, but the one that started Bloomberg News, all right? I think his name's Matt Wink, Wink, Winkleman or something like that, Winkle. Now, he, he had a a um a audio he was being recorded on on, on radio and he also did a, a tv broadcast i think it was on thursday but it was played on thursday and friday you know where he's talking about the economics are improving in the in detroit and that the you know and, and the autos and michigan is you know is is one of the swing states all right michigan is an important state so is wisconsin so is pennsylvania so is arizona all right but Michigan is important. All right. So what does Bloomberg do? Because they're orange man bad. Because, you know, these typical stupids, you know, they, they, he's saying, well, when they do a survey of individual, individual economic well-being, the people in Michigan are better off now than they were before they started 
with the Biden administration. Well, that was right in the middle of the crisis of 2020. I mean, I'm not really sure if you really, that's a good comparison. But, but the point he was making is, is that when you, when you get the, 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 the overall average feeling of the economy from an individual, they'll say the economy is bad. But if the, you ask their personal situation, at least in Michigan, they're saying it's better. All right. So Bloomberg's pushing the state's going to go blue. Now, my understanding is, is the reason why in the midterm it went blue, right, was because of abortion, the, the abortion issue. Well, the abortion issue isn't in, even on the, on the ballot. So it's going to be interesting if it goes red for the presidency or blue. So they can't play the abortion card in Michigan. But the thing is, is that they're worried because they can't play the abortion card that they have to make sure that the economy seems to be okay. Well, maybe the Federal Reserve is, you know, maybe they'll give, you know, Biden a little bit of uh, of leeway and ease or hold, not tighten. As long as the inflation doesn't spike or, you know, during the next few months to help him along. I definitely see some sort of alignment with Bloomberg and Biden administration. That's what we need to be upset with. With people well beyond his base, and he's going to try to contrast it with feeble old Joe Biden. They think that works. That's why Joe Biden. Uh, guess what, Joe? Joe Biden is feeble. needs to be aggressive and push back hard. Mm. Uh, but then, Charlie, I, I guess the Trump campaign is able to say, and perhaps this is what they're saying, you know, we didn't do that. This is like happening on the highway. Somebody else did this. But they are not condemning it. And, and by him posting on Truth Social, he's using it as an instrument, if you will, an extension of the very sentiment that he's trying to potentially incite or encourage. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the former president feels like it's okay because there's some dis there is some distance between the action, what actually happened, and, you know, it's his supporters who did it. It's not him. Well, it's come... The Biden administration doesn't say much about Julia Assange because there's a distance. He's in a different country. He's not leaking in important information about the national security state. So he gets cover because Julia Assange is distant. But we can't we can't have that for Trump. If he's distant from one of his supporters and the supporter wants to hog tie in some sort of visual graphic on the truck. We can't have that distance. No, no, Trump can't, can't have that. No, 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 no. But it's okay for Biden to have distance with Julian Assange. So you can wash, wash his hands clean. Completely absurd and disingenuous for the Trump campaign to say we didn't do this when they reposted it. They broadcast it uh, intentionally. Uh, so I don't know how they can even you know, say something like that with a straight face. But I mean, it really just get to the political discourse in this country. You know, when I was a candidate for office, you know, I, when I would attack my opponent, it was always on a matter of public record. Something they said or something they did, a vote they took. It was always that way. It just seems now anything goes. It's crazy. Now, to be fair, you know, Joe Biden... What about the lawfare that's going on? What about when someone doesn't show up to Congress, they end up getting thrown in prison? If you're a Trump... If you if were part of the Trump circle. It's cabinet. Advisors. But when you're Hunter Biden and you just walk out, 
or you don't show up, it's okay. It's okay. No, what's happening, you got to wake up. You got to wake up. The Democratic Party plays with no rules. The Republican Party tries to play by rules. There's the problem, is you have a Democratic Party that is going to the gutter. Well, the only way you can fight gutter is be gutter. A few years ago, made some comment too that you know he'd take Trump out behind the gym or something and beat the hell out of him. I mean, okay, you know that's probably not helpful either. Uh, and so, oh, I was, but we can't say that. And that was a direct threat. Biden says this. Oh, okay, all right, it's okay for Biden. And it was, you know, it wasn't the best thing to say, but it's okay. You know, Biden's just. Venting steam. It's okay, BLM. Just steal, you know, from Fifth Avenue. It's okay. It's okay. Demand reparations and have these these blue states push reparations in the state legislature. Oh, it's okay. There, people need to start paying attention. There is a boiling anger that is starting to happen in the United States. And the Democrats are not gonna win on this. Look at this, look at Joe Welch, all right? He looks kind of feeble. He doesn't look too healthy. Political discourse is, we don't have the same level of a, a serious public policy conversations that can be, you know, aggressive and negative too. But but it, but it's about things of public record, and this is just this is just the the latest political insanity that is uh, really driven by this negative partisanship. Where it's not so much that we like our guy, it's that we hate the other guy more. And this is just another clear example of it. Mm -hmm. here, here, quickly, Fred. Here's the other reason why Trump thinks this is okay. How many? It's been almost 24 hours. How many Republicans? have spoken out against this? How many Republicans have called him out? None. Okay, and so you're as long as that's the case. <laughs> you're the only two so yeah. You know what's yeah, amazing? Right. You know what's amazing is how CNN, see, see here's the problem with the, the individuals within the Republican Party, all right? Now, obviously, the, the Democratic Party is, is, is crazy, all right? Ultra-liberal crazy, all right? But there's a, there's a fissure within the Republican Party, and you can see it with the McConnell, you know, crowd, all right? These two Republicans, all right? I thought Jack, I thought Joe Welsh was was a Democrat. He's a Republican. He was a Republican. Or, yeah, was a, was a former U.S. representative as a Republican in, 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 in Illinois. But, um, but what you're seeing is, is that there's this, the, the McConnell crowd, anti-Trump, orange man bad. And so CNN straddles that. All the Democrats, you know, hate Trump, right? And then you have this, the McConnell crowd, the never Trumpers, right? And then you have the base that's for, for Trump, right? Is the optics great for Trump with, with the truck? No, not really. But you know, the thing is, because, now hear me out on this, because Trump has financial difficulty because of all these lawfares, he's playing the Hollywood game. All publicity is good publicity because it gets his name in the news. Because he doesn't have as much advertising dollars. They could spend all their time calling out Trump. They could spend all their time calling out Trump for everything he's ever done. That's, I mean, that's one thing that they're so frustrated with. I think a lot of these Republican members just want to go away. 
They don't want to have to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there, gentlemen. Oh, well, they're cowards. They're, yeah. they're cowards and they're enabling it. That's what they're doing. They've made that calculation, Charlie. They want to keep their jobs. They want to stay in Congress. Mm -hmm. So they keep. If there is a growing population that's supporting Trump, and those representatives are supposed to do the will of the people within the context of the Constitution, then they are supposed to support Trump <laughs> because that's the will of the people. If the will of the people wasn't there, then there would be a different story. It's the will of the people and the people are frustrated because they are seeing their country being dismantled in front of them. mouth shut mm. so sad all right joe walsh charlie dance i'm glad you're not keeping your mouth shut and you are with <laughs> us to talk about it <laughs> God, i can't stand her this is pnn please go to my store the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the health max i either have health max 14 or health max 35 health max 35 is 35 ppms Health Max 14 is 14 ppm parts per million. You, this has structural nano silver liquid. You take a teaspoon of it a day. You swish it in your mouth. You gargle with it. You swallow it. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. It's part of my protocol to help boost up your immune system and slow down the aging process. Take, go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and also get the, the vitamin C. Right, to help boost up your immune system and to help with the collagen. You need collagen and vitamin C to do cross-link to help with the dermal layer of your skin. Ashwagandha root, really important to control your blood glucose levels and bring down that those pro that that pro-inflammation from glucose. So take the ashwagandha every day. It's part of my anti-aging protocol. Clarity factor helps to remove the brain fog. So take this every day and improve your mental acuity. And B3, really important for gene expression. It's a cofactor. It also helps to, to get cells to go into apoptosis, especially when they're infected. So this is very important to you know, add this to your protocol to help with gene expression, getting rid of cells that have been infected through apoptosis, in addition, it helps to absorb calcium. So to improve your health, get the D3. Resveratrol. It's part of the anti, my anti-aging protocol. It will help with, it's also a, an antioxidant. It is synergistic with C60. So take this every day to improve that those that mitochondrial health to improve the 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 um, um the cell by reducing the stress that's that's happening in the cell so go to my store the dash studio dash reykjavik.com and get the supplements now what i want to do is i want to take a look at um i want to take a look at one more This is about Putin. This is Fox News. The elites are laughing at us. They've come right out and said it. By 2030, they want us to own nothing and be happy. And it's not hard to see that this plan is already is behaving properly. When in fact, the objective needs to be. Everyone is curious about trying to find out what is you know, the name and the man, the former Secretary of State, kind enough to join us. Uh, Secretary, always good having you on. I, I know Hope it's Springs a Journal that, that, you know, you, you capture some of their bad guys. They're more inclined right now to negotiate to release some of our good guys. Never seems to materialize, though. I, I, there was even talk with uh, Alexei Navalny uh, when Vladimir Putin had said just days after his death, we were so close to a deal to get him out. 
I don't know who to believe. What about you? Well, yeah, it's great to be with you. Uh, you know, these are very difficult situations. Uh, the, the hostage work was some of the most gut-wrenching personal work that I did as Secretary of State a little bit when I was CI director as well. You know, as for getting Evan out, uh, there is only one thing. Director Panetta had one part of that right. There's only one good. thing that Vladimir Putin will release it for, and that is if he believes there's a real cost if he doesn't do so. And to date, apparently, there has been nothing offered to Vladimir Putin that will convince him to release Evan Gershevich. After capturing Russian spies, we should do that. <laughs> we should do that regardless of whether they're holding our, someone uh, in detain, wrongful detainment in Russia. If there are Russian spies operating in the United States, for goodness sake, let's go get them. Not because we have a, someone being held in Russia, but because we need to get them off the streets. Uh, there, there's always trades that can be made. Uh, that's very dangerous. We saw that when we got that Brittany Griner. They just take war. They just stock the inventory, Neil. And so this, this is a question of power and President Biden's capacity to demonstrate cost. And to date, I've seen no evidence that this administration is prepared to impose a real cost on Vladimir Putin to get Evan home. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something that is Kabbalistic. It's metaphysical. All right. Just hear me out on this. As I was telling you that the that um, there was a dark cloud that started across the world on December 1st. 2023 all right and there in january near the end of january there was the inflection point where esau's soul root loses power and jacob's soul root gains power and in relative terms jacob's power is higher than esau's power and this ebb and flows, this, there's a cycle between Esau and Jacob every six months. So every three months within the new epoch of a particular soul root, there is a peak. Okay? So this soul root for, for Jacob started to gain power at the end of January, beginning of February. So you have February, March, April. Peaks in April. All right. This is also when Passover is happening. And then it's still relatively stronger than Esau, but it starts to decline in relative terms. All right. Because it's on the down cycle, but it's still higher than, than, um, than Esau. So that's May, June, July. And then the inflection point happens again in August and Esau is stronger than Jacob. This is the reason why I, I have said that during this period of time, movement for Israel in Gaza, um, and in this case, uh, Rafa, um, has to ramp up because Jacob's soul root stronger than Esau. In addition, um, you're hearing in the news about Hezbollah being at, being attacked by Israel. So it, Israel's target on Hezbollah is increasing during the soul root increase with Jacob. All right. Now, why is this important with what's going on in Ukraine? Well, there's funding issues by the United States to Ukraine. And Ukraine is showing uh, um, uh, staled activity or retreatment of their operations because of lack of munitions. So by extending to June 30th, he's right at the tail end, right, of Jacob. And you wait one more month and, you know, about, you know, three weeks, basically, to four weeks, then Esau's soul root starts to gain strength from Jacob. Now, it seems to me that not completely, but the soul root of Jacob is, the, is aligned with the, the soul root of the United States, but not completely. The United States is not completely aligned with Jacob, all right? But aligned enough. If you looked at a Venn diagram, it would be more kind of like, you know, there's a lot of overlap, but not completely, all right? 
by pushing back Kabbalistically the date, it gives leverage for Putin to be able to, um, you know, have some leverage with the, the negotiations. All right. And I'm concerned that if the United States in Israel or in the Ukraine does a tactical error, that this could get really bad. All right. This is why I'm going to dovetail this into conversations with uh, Annie uh, Jacobson. All right. About world war. All right. And that, you know, we've heard about October surprises. Well, October is the strengthening month of Esau for the soul group. So just keep this in mind. I'm concerned about some dates here. All right. I keep on seeing, I don't know why, but I keep on seeing this date 9-24-24. And it seems to be related to New York. And it seems to be related to the UN. Now, I don't know if something happens in the world where there's this big discussion at the UN, you know, around 924, or what this all means. I don't know. All right. But I do know this that is a period of time that Esau is strong and gain, gaining strength. And so a system that seems to be stable, can radically go into discoherence, go into chaos with very little warning. And that's what I, I am saying. And this push out to June 30th, depending on how the United States reacts, depends on the potentiality of an increased probability of this chaotic event that could happen this year. All right. I'm not saying that it's definitely going to happen. I'm just saying that there is things that are starting to align that are scary. All right. And hopefully it doesn't happen, but there are some strategic things that could happen that sets things in motion really quick. All right. You know, this is the type of behavior, Secretary, you, you, you kind of expect that of a banana republic or a third world country. I mean, whatever you think of Russia, it, it is still a superpower. Um, it, it, they, they're, they're, they're punching way under their weight. And I'm just wondering, uh, do they have any concept of how that looks to the world? Welcome to Flat Iron School. This is where you learn how the future works. Where the whole point of education is to get you a job and a career you love. Neil, they do, but they don't give a rip. Uh, this is a long tradition. Mm -hmm. that this goes back. Uh, we are director going to talk about his time. It goes back. It predates that right, too. Right. Uh, we, 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 we have frankly rewarded a lot of countries uh, for taking Americans and holding them. And they find it lucrative. They find it of value. It's how they get a better position for themselves. And the, there's, there's no domestic cost, obviously, for Vladimir Putin in doing so. And so here we find ourselves. You know, um, I, I mentioned in the context also the Ukraine war. Uh, and we're two years into that, right, Secretary? And uh, Vladimir Putin is personally the richest he's ever been. Uh, and oil revenues that were supposed to be sort of choked off uh, are, are at a record high. Russia right now, and it's capitalizing off these higher energy prices. It, it just seems like upside down world. Yeah, yeah, I think it truly is. Look, I think there, I think there's three big mistakes that have caused us to go on now two years and a handful of months. Uh, the first, obviously, was losing deterrence, not convincing Vladimir Putin there'd be a real cost for taking part of Ukraine. Uh, we were able to do it for four years. Uh, we lost it when we left office. Uh, second. Uh, we've not held, again, this is much like the, the, the issue with Evan, we, we've not held anything that Vladimir Putin values at risk. When, when he knows that Ukrainian mothers are putting their children tonight at bed to bed at night and feeling like they may not wake up, but Russian mothers in Moscow are putting their children to bed, and that's all good. There's nothing, there's no cost for Vladimir Putin. Uh, the, the final piece, and this is the, really the one you get to, the sanctions efforts that the administration began with, where Jake Sullivan came out and said, don't worry, it's just going to take a little bit of time. 
proved to be completely feckless. They, they didn't set oil embargoes. They didn't ban the product. They simply set a price cap, and the Russians have found a way to work around that. Sanctions are only a value meal if you enforce them and you make them punitive. This administration chose to not do that because they didn't want gasoline at the pump in America to be expensive in an election year. That's a mistake. It certainly didn't achieve. These sanctions certainly have not achieved their objective. And in fact, you're right. They've made Vladimir Putin even more wealthy in the Russian em- enterprise, arming their military even easier for him. So, um, so if I can switch gears here to Israel, I, I'm not even sure a delegation from Israel is coming here or not, whether this will be a video conference. Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, had scrapped the idea uh, when we abstained from this vote that called for an immediate ceasefire. First time I believe that's ever happened. Uh, we are promising $3.8 billion in, in, in or, or, sorry, on top of the $3.8 billion we give in aid to Israel every year, and some more aid and more arms coming to them. Uh, but it seems we're, we're handling it gingerly. And then I'm reminded of Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, who said about Israel, more aid, fewer war crimes. He was referring to their behavior in Gaza and, and saying that um, you, you got to be helping folks and not committing more war crimes. What did you think of that? You know, I... It's a war crime to actually embed your military your freedom fighters with the public. Where is that in the news? Hamas is doing war crimes just by embedding their operations within the civilian population. War crimes, what about the war crimes about the actual burning of civilians during October 7th. That's a war crime by Hamas. Those two war crimes. Now, I'm sure that there are idiosyncratic situations with certain soldiers mistreating, you know, let's say the IDF mistreating Hamas soldiers or even mistreating some civilians. I'm sure that's happening. All wars, there, that happens. But the real war crime is Hamas embedding in the civilian population. And the thing is, it's like a cancer. How are you going to get the cancer out without damaging some of the normal tissue? So they need to get, the the, the international community needs to wake up. And that it's going to continue until Hamas is dead. So it's not a war crime on, on Israel. The war crime is on Hamas. Now, I'm sure there will be people out there that are that are anti-Israeli, anti-Israel, or whatever, that disagree with me. That's okay. You can disagree with me. The fact is this. Hamas is embedding in their population. Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. Now, people would say, well, there's some sort of occupation of Palestine by the, 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 you know, the Israelis and blah, blah, blah. The thing is, is, is that Israel and this whole soul route between Jacob and Esau is not a Westphalian concept. You can't use international affairs and politics to think that you're going to get homeostasis. It's not going to work. It's biblical. And one side is going to have to annihilate the other, period. Now, people would say, that's a genocide. We're talking about the military apparatus of, of, of the people. The military apparatus of Israel has to be completely destroyed, or the military apparatus of Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran have to be completely destroyed. That's the battle between Jacob and Esau. Now, I'm pretty sure that if Jacob wins, the rest of the world will be okay. I'm not so sure if Esau wins, that the rest of the world will be okay, a.k.a. World Caliphate. I think in some ways, Senator Schumer, Senator Holland have just lost the thread here. They've lost the focus. Uh, the focus is uh, making sure that something like what happened on October 7th never happens again and imposing real costs on the Iranian regime for having funded, trained, and facilitated what happened on October 7th. They seem... They seem so focused on their left wing of their own democratic base, the, the sort of the pro-Hamas part of their party, instead of the defeat of Hamas and making sure that 
We don't have hundreds of human beings that Americans still held hostage, raped, tortured in the way they were on October 7th. I, you know, all the Democratic chatter to about today is about slowing down Israel, making sure Israel is behaving properly, when in fact the objective needs to be the defeat, the destruction. The only thing that the Democratic Party cares about is the optics. Because they're worried that their base is starting to, to turn against them because of what's happening in the Middle East. And they need Michigan to win. Remember what I said? They need Michigan to win. Well, Dearborn is a gigantic Muslim population. Gigantic. It's all about the election. Should have all of the entirety of the infrastructure of Hamas. Do you get a sense, uh, we've never done this, of course the UN vote thing was an unprecedented act as well, but we never cut aid, or we might have been in the past, you know history on this matter far better than I did, where we, if Israel wasn't towing a line that an administration had, it, you know, there was always the inference maybe your aid will be cut or threatened. Do you think that's what's next? I hope not. It, it wouldn't make any sense in the current context. Remember, the, the, the Israelis are fighting a common foe. They're fighting the Iranian regime. They're fighting a common foe not only of the United States and of Israel, but of the Gulf Arab states as well. They're the world's largest state sponsor terror and to deny resources for Israel to conduct a campaign that keeps Americans safer would be both uh, pound foolish and silly and dangerous. I'm, I'm just wondering, as we step back from this, and it's always a crazy world, and you've written a great deal about it. You've been the CIA director, the Secretary of State. You, you've witnessed it and dealt with it and tried to, 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 to improve it. it. It is what it is. But uh, it, it seems like bad guys are winning a PR war, right? I mean, Moss, it now looks like a sympathetic figure. China that plays in the, in the eyes of many in the press of states unlike role in these crises. Russia, as I said, and Vladimir Putin, uh, getting the Remember what I was saying about the wave of Esau and Jacob and how they're inversely related. But there are different frequencies of these waves. There is a long frequency and a short frequency. I explained the short frequency in terms of a year. There are actually frequencies within a, within a day and also in a, within a week. So, but let's not get to the to the the nuances of that system at such a small time interval. There's also wavelengths that are of hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. All right. And we have seen the, you know, in history that the Jewish people for many, many hundreds of years, actually about 2000 years, uh, where they were in the down cycle and Esau was gaining strength. All right. Now there's also an attachment of the, the soul root of Jacob and the Christian faith. It's not completely aligned, just like the United States is not completely aligned to the soul root of Jacob, but they're more aligned than they are to Esau. All right. So as the as the Jewish, as the as the the soul root of Jacob went down, so was the soul root in part was being pulled down for the Christians, all right, and the rise of Islam, all right, and then there was a battle, you know, there were battles that took place, and then, the, you know, and it ebbed and flowed, and Jerusalem was taken over by the Christians, and then lost it, but if you look at, if you zoom out for 2,000 years, all right, or 1,500 years, all right, we are looking at, um, you know, a uh, mostly in the aggregate, a downward of the soul root of Jacob and then an upward of the soul root of Esau. Then, you know, what happens around World War II is this inflection point where it's the beginnings of a new huge era, all right? Not just an, an annual era or a weekly era, or a monthly era, or a decade era, but hundreds of year era, all right? And this is happening around World War II, all right? 
some people could, you know, state that it actually is happening around 1700s. Um, you know, with the beginnings of some leaking of Kabbalistic texts and, 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 and thought. All right. So around, you know, maybe 1750, you know, maybe is the beginning, the actual beginning of the inflection point. Right. And it just, as you look at these, as you look at these curves, they're, they're, they're getting more power over time, you know, so that one could make an argument that the delineation point for the inflection is around the enlightenment period. All right. Another one could argue that the inflection point is happening around World War II. All right. So either way, the point here is, is that there's a down cycle in the long wave in terms of time for Esau and an up cycle for the soul root of Jacob. All right. So keep that in mind here. And and also oh, so, okay, so, 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 so with that and I'm gonna make this this one last point. So because of this this inflection point, as Esau is losing strength in the long wave of time, they're the underdog now. Meanwhile, the Jews were the underdog. All right. Jacob, the soul root of Jacob was the underdog. Right? So now just like during the Crusades, the Christians were the underdog when the Crusades just started. So liberals, ultra liberals, are not going to be great because their soul root isn't it isn't housed in, isn't rooted in Jacob. They are going to be antithetical to this movement of Jacob, and they're going to gravitate. To the underdog, they're going to gravitate to the soul root of Esau. Now, I know this sounds really strange, and most people don't understand what I'm saying. It's okay, I'm right though. So, but this this is the this is the metaphysical thing that we're seeing that's playing out. And so, it's if you're going to listen to liberal media, if you're going to listen to liberal, you know, a liberal um, persuasion or a liberal lens, they're gonna look at it that Esau is losing, losing and Jacob is gaining and therefore the international community needs to help Esau and not realizing that this is a battle between the twins for thousands of years and that every time you intervene, you're only gonna make it worse down the road. And, and there's a little, none of this makes sense, Secretary. You know, I, I actually, I think I did. Cavuto, I just told you, that's what's happening. You can't use Westphalian logic. This is a battle of the soul roots. And that there is a mean reversion back to biblical boundaries. That means that the Palestinians don't get they don't get the West Bank. They don't get Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, some of Lebanon and some of Syria is, is, is going back to Israel too. And Jordan. It'll take time. There will be a two-state solution, but it ain't gonna be it ain't gonna be West Bank. It's gonna be Gaza for the Palestinians. That's it. That's it. And until people realize this and that the Dome of the Rock is coming down, everything's going to be in an uproar. Because it's not by mistake that they attacked on October 7th. Now, yes, there probably was intelligence failures and blah, blah, blah. And I've given you my reasons on why that happened. You know, people are saying that, you know, there was, you know, some sort of stand down and all this stuff that has to be investigated. But I think that if there was a will by God to stop it, he would have it stopped. God wanted it to happen because of the infighting that was going on between the Jewish people, the ultra liberals and the, and 
the orthodox or you know you can say that this ultra liberal and conservative faction that's taking place um this fissure within within the, the state of israel all right and that's why it happened to galvanize the nation to, to become more cohesive even though they're not as cohesive as they should be all right and it, that's going to be problematic especially metaphysically all right so with the attack they know meaning the the muslims they know about the red heifers all right and the, all this the sacrificing the red heifers when it does happen which should be soon you know it has to be within this year or so um uh when that is all done this is moving right to the dome of the rock 100 percent. they know this the muslims know this their clear their clerics know this their imams know this they're not uneducated in terms of the metaphysical they know about esau and jacob and the soul roots and all this and they try to play the game they pr tr try to game it because what did I say? October is the, is the strengthening month of, of Esau, right? Well, they, attack, they attacked in, on October. So, you know, the point here is, is that they're trying to slowly stop the inevitable. The Muslims are trying to stop the rebooting of the temple. It's not going to be stopped. And the more that they they have their fit, the more death and destruction will, will ensue, the more collateral damage there will be, especially if they embed themselves within the, the population. But this is going to mean revert to biblical times. We don't have a say. Mankind doesn't have a say on this. It is, it is of divine providence. It's of divine edict. We don't have a say. It's going to happen. And all the discussions at the UN it won't mean diddly squat. It won't mean anything. The question that, that we have in our in our power is how bloody is it going to be? Is it going to be a peaceful transition or is it going to be a lot of blood on the street? A bloodbath, literally. Agree with you. I don't, I don't think they're winning the PR war. I think they may be winning the propaganda campaign, and that may be influencing some across a broad, broad spectrum of the West. Think of not only the United States and Europe, but of other democracies, places like South Korea and Japan. I think what this requires is doubling down on an understanding of who we are and the things that matter inside of our own nations. If we get it wrong here at home, if we don't teach our kids that this is an indeed an exceptional nation, and that America is a force for good wherever it goes, not that we don't screw up from time to time, but we're out there trying to make life better for not only the American people, but for people all across the world. If we if we lose that thread in how we're educating our children, I think you may be right. It could be that the bad guys, the evildoers, uh, win the narrative. And when you win that storyline, when you are viewed as the strong horse, bad things happen here at home. Well, I certainly hope you're right, and I am horribly wrong. Um, most news networks are wrong. They can't get to the root cause of things. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the C60. I have it in avocado and coconut in a two-ounce, a four-ounce, and an eight-ounce configuration. Please go to the store. This is a very strong antioxidant. It helps to bring down those free radicals and improve this, the cellular health and the mitochondrial health. So you're going to have more ATP. You're going to have less stress in the cell, and you're going to slow down the aging process. And you know what? By doing that, you're going to actually start seeing health benefits. And some of the ailments that you, you've been experiencing as you age will start to diminish. Please go to my store and also get the turmeric. It is a great antioxidant. It brings down that inflammation. It's part of boosting up your immune system and slowing down the aging process. Please go to my store and get the powdered probiotic. I take this every day. I mix it with, with hummus, but you can mix it with your food or with water. Take it every day to get the proper gut biome. And if you are not sleeping well, it is really important to get REM sleep 
because it brings down those toxins. It helps to filter out toxins. It helps you to consolidate memory. And it also helps you to get a uh, restful sleep um, and, and be more energetic, right? Well, if you're not getting the REM sleep, the three cycles of REM sleep, those benefits that I just mentioned don't happen. If you're not getting three cycles of REM sleep, you're not consolidating memory like you should be. You're not detoxifying your body like you should be. So if you're not getting the, the sleep that you need, go to my store and get the good night formula. The, this has tryptophan and melatonin in it. Take it every day so you get the restful sleep that you need to be able to detoxify your, your central nervous system and detoxify your other tissues that are outside of the central nervous system. In addition, by getting that REM sleep, you're going to have better memory, you're going to have better mental acuity. And by the way, there's been research that shows that by making sure that you have restful sleep on a regular basis, that you're going to slow down the aging process and reduce dementia. So take my advice. It's a holistic approach to be able to improve your health. Now, what I want to do is play Pierce Morgan talking to Annie Jacobs, Jacobson on Moscow attack and nuclear threat. This was recorded five days ago. Vladimir Putin commands the world's biggest nuclear arsenal and stakes his authoritarian grip on providing strength and security for the massive terrorist gun attack at a Moscow concert hall on Friday, killing more than 130 people, is the Kremlin's worst nightmare. ISIS case claim responsibility. Russia, without any evidence, says Ukraine played a part in the attack. Two of the four suspects pleaded guilty after they were allegedly tortured by Russian security services. One reportedly received electric shocks to his genitals. Another was allegedly forced to eat his own ear. Well, attention is now turning to how Putin will respond. Does, does his attack on Russia make the world a more dangerous place? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Annie Jacobson, investigative journalist and author of the new book, A Nuclear War, A Scenario. Well, it's a scenario, Annie Jacobson, that we're all beginning to have to get our heads around, isn't it? Because the mm -hmm. saber rattling from Putin before this about using nuclear weapons was getting louder and louder. I can't imagine it will get uh, any less loud uh, following a terror attack of this magnitude. First of all, uh, welcome to Uncensored. Uh, let me just say that from the top. Great to have you. Um, Thank what's you. your take on this terror attack? We haven't heard much from ISIS for quite a while. Why have they targeted Russia? How damaging is this to Putin? I mean, it is an interesting concept we're dealing with right now. And when I think of Putin, I think of the fact that he is the longest serving Russian president since Joseph Stalin. And so everything that happens in his orbit is about power. I mean, to come out of the gate and blame, you know, your sort of obvious adversary, Ukraine, for something that the rest of the world clearly thinks is ISIS, puts him at odds with a lot of people. Yeah, and, and there's no evidence for that at all, but ISIS have brazenly claimed all credit for it and released videos uh, rather like uh, Hamas did on October the 7th, glorifying what they did. So this idea that somehow this is all part of a Zelensky plot is clearly for the birds. Um, turning to, to Putin and his power, we just had another uh, pretty much a, a, the, the personification of a rigged election. He's not going to lose as long as he's... I personally believe that the terrorist attack that was going on in Russia was CIA operation. Now, why? To somewhat, there, twofold. To one, to potentially weaken the status of Putin um, in his country. But what it did seem is, is they actually galvanized his status uh, and, and elevated him. Um, but also, it was to push him because what's going on in Congress at the time was that the United States doesn't, you know, wasn't going to fund Ukraine. You know, it's stalled. The funding is stalled. Well, have this happen and 
Russia puts more effort in the war to um, advance, Zelensky doesn't have the means to, to stop it. And it would be a perfect opportunity for Congress to pass support for Zelensky and c continue the war effort because the national security state wants the money to flow to Ukraine. Well, create some sort of event in Russia that can be in his eyes um, uh, uh, caused by Ukraine and, you know, be able to move the war effort move the, the, the war effort forward you know, in your, Ukraine and the national security state gets what they gets what they want that's the take that i have at this moment in time i don't believe that it was by accident i don't believe that it was some sort of you know isis k by themselves deciding to attack russia at that important moment in, in time I think it was CIA helped, CIA funded, CIA orchestrated. And let's keep in mind, Putin said this was happening during the Bush administration, Bush Jr.'s administration, when Putin was stating, stop it. And remember on Tucker, when Tucker was interviewing him and Basically, the State Department said that they were going to continue and on, continue on funding these militia groups that were circling Russia. CIA has been known to be doing stuff like this. It's too easy of an answer to oh, say it's just ISIS elections. What do you make of his constant threats to the West about potentially utilizing his nuclear armor? Mm -hmm. I mean, the saber rattling coming out of his mouth is astonishing to me. You know, I just wrote a book on nuclear war. I give you a fact-based scenario. And when I began writing that book several years ago, with my research going back a decade, I had no idea that we would be looking at this kind of everyday threats. Look, Putin said on the record that he was not joking about using weapons of mass destruction. It's so alarming, it's frightening to everyone involved. How likely is it that how would the United see... States how would the United States react if there was some sort of southern power within South America amalgamating and building up capability to dis deterrence capability against the United States and moving it right up to the board, you know, right up to Mexico. Don't you think the United States would get a little pissed off? Well, that's exactly what's happening with NATO and Russia. We caused the problem because we wanted to expand NATO and we had this concept that we were gonna just to, to fracture Russia and get its resources. A conflict. I mean, look, the whole of the Department of Defense's position on nuclear weapons, on nuclear war, is something called deterrence, right? And also known as prevention. This idea that you can have enough nuclear weapons pointed at the other side, and everyone agrees never to use them. And so entering into this domain as we are now, where you have, you know, nuclear armed nations threatening one another with nuclear weapons, it just, it changes the atmosphere that has been in place for decades. And it makes the world on the razor's edge. I mean, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations said recently that we're just one miscalculation or one misunderstanding away from total Armageddon. Because don't forget, there's no such thing. This is exactly what the documentary of Countdown to Zero was all about. And she's gonna probably mention it in this video, but definitely in 
you know, the next video, the next video that I do, she is making the case that this poor calculation, this miscalculation of using tactical nukes will break the fear of using them and lead to ICBM, in, you know, usage. And this, and then it's game over. a limited nuclear war. That is an oft repeated phrase in Washington. It only ends in nuclear holocaust. So if somebody does make a miscalculation or does that quite deliberately because they've gone mad or whatever the reason may be, right. then it would be Armageddon. That's right. I mean, that is, that is the end game. And so, you know, one of the things that I was this is where Anne and I agree and disagree. We agree that there's there there is this miscalculation miscal that can can happen by either side, the United States or or Russia. But the root cause of this issue is one we allowed as citizens of the world allowed the Damocles of nuclear weapons to still be around. Two we allowed NATO's expansion. If there was an integration economically of Russia post the fall of the Berlin Wall, where they were more aligned with the United States economically, we wouldn't have had a Putin problem. That's the issue. The national security state fucked us up. fascinated. When I was reporting the book, I came across one of these declassified nuclear war games that the Pentagon declassified recently, and it goes back to 1983. But of course, the nuclear war plans, by the way, are like the most jealously guarded secrets in the U.S. government. And when you look at what a a declassified war game looks like, by the way, I reprint a page in the book. It's like 95% redacted, right? So you say to yourself, uh, what's the point of releasing it? Well, in that situation, it allowed a certain individual, a Yale professor named Paul Bracken, to talk about uh, the war plan without the war games, without you know breaking his security clearance. And what he told us answers your question, which is that yes, no matter how nuclear war begins, it only ends in Armageddon. The Proud Prophet war game showed like- Annie, all you have to do is look at war games that was released in the 80s when they were talking about putting our missiles on Whopper and letting a computer make the decision. The whole point of the movie was there was no winners. The scenarios which I found fascinating to learn about sort of obliquely that, for example, like if NATO were to get involved or if NATO doesn't get involved, if China got involved, if China didn't, no matter what, it only ends one way, end game, end of civilization. And I think that's enough to like terrify everyone on this planet into realizing nuclear saber rattling is a very bad idea. And, and in terms um, of the it's not just nuclear saber rattling, Annie, it's nuclear anything in dealing with weapons. They need to be abolished. No country should have this capability. Period. And we don't have wise people anymore. And you have irrational actors now, especially in the Middle East with Iran. See, it's of the various superpowers. Mm -hmm. How many nuclear weapons does America have? How many does Russia have? Mm -hmm. How many does China have? And of those weapons, how many are currently able to be used? Right. I mean, great questions. And again, these were, as I was reporting the book, these were like shocking, jaw-dropping revelations that I was going through 
learning one after the next. And by the way, these are not declassified. The Federation of American Scientists here in America keeps track of the warheads that are what are called forward deployed, that are can be launched in seconds and minutes. And of course, they change every year by like a few numbers. But the United States has 1,770 forward deployed nuclear weapons ready for launch. Russia has essentially the same. That's the parity thanks to the treaty. So they have 1,660. China last year had 410. This year they have 500. The Defense Department recently announced that they believe China will have as many as 1,500 nuclear warheads ready for launch in the next decade. So you can see this kind of madness is just escalating and getting to this point where, you know, when you consider that we have nine nuclear armed nations now, the idea of two superpowers locked, you know, with their sabers pointed at one another is no longer that situation. Things are getting really unstable. And we know, obviously, from uh, the beginning of the end of World War II about the nuclear weapons that were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. How does the power of these ready-to-be-deployed nukes right now compare mm -hmm. to those bombs that were dropped? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, orders of magnitude. So to report the book, I interviewed sort of top-tier, upper-echelon national security advisors to the president, former secretaries of defense, weapons engineers. One of the most stunning series of interviews I did was with Richard Garwin. And that name might not be familiar to viewers. He is the man who drew the architectural plans for the first thermonuclear weapon. So everyone thinks of Edward Teller as the inventor of the thermonuclear bomb, which he was, but he, uh, he couldn't figure out a way to actually make it explode. Garwin did that as a young man in 1952. And what Garwin explained to me, I asked Garwin the same question that you're asking me, is like, how do bombs differ? Because sort of the smartest people in the room tend to be able to really simplify things. And Garwin simplified it for me like this. He said that, a thermonuclear bomb uses an atomic bomb as the fuse. And so that gives you an idea. The, the Ivy Mike bomb, that the first one that Garwin drew that exploded with 10 megatons of power was approximately 1,000 Hiroshima, Hiroshima bombs going off simultaneously from a single center line. I mean, think about that in terms of power. And how many of, say, America and Russia's current deployable nuclear weapons would have mm -hmm. that kind of power? Almost all of them. I mean, I really source the sizes of the weapons and the warheads. And, you know, there are some ballistic missiles that are called MERV. It means they have multiple warheads that can release. And I mean, the sort of mayhem and madness of nuclear weapons is both specific and general in my book, meaning, you know, you, I give you, I try to give the readers the sort of really specific sense of urgency. And then if you want to nerd out on the numbers you're asking, you can look in the back of the book to read all these specific statistics. And again, these are kept track of very meticulously by organizations that are working to sort of make nuclear weapons make the, the facts and figures about all of this very much on the record. So it's just a matter of getting people to actually care about these things, be interested in them. In them. And as a storyteller, for me, it was like, show the people in the most horrific detail possible, fact-based detail, just how horrific a nuclear war would be so that something can be done about all of this. I mean, is the reason why you are convinced if it started, that would be the end, simply because if you think about what you've just been telling me, if Russia mm -hmm. or the United States or China was to let off one of their nuclear weapons and it had the power of a thousand Hiroshima's, just mm -hmm. imagining the devastation that that would cause, 
would compel any country on the receiving end to unleash their own immediately. There would be no hesitation. There couldn't be for risk of more coming. And therefore, you get the you get the firefight, but not involving normal weaponry, involving weaponry that can devastate presumably miles and miles and miles and miles of cities in a flash. That's right. And, and also the policies in place that, again, are all open sourced on the record. And also the timing of the events is really what is most shocking, right? So like, unlike a terrorist attack, which you see today, people wait, they respond, they decide how to respond, they have sort of meetings, what should we do? That's not how nuclear war works. Nuclear war works in seconds and minutes, not in days and weeks. And, you know, again, I take the reader through the technical aspects of this because they're really stunning to know. We have a policy called launch on warning here in the United States. And what that means is the moment that the president is told that a nuclear missile is on the way to the United States, he he immediately chooses a nuclear counterattack. Mm -hmm. And as a former Secretary of Defense told me, that is policy, we do not wait, period. So there's no question of a sitting president of the United States mulling over what the response should be. It's automatic. Now, let me just give you my take because I think that I have a unique way of looking at the met metadata here. It's not by accident that Anne is on the news now talking about nuclear threat. All right. Now it took time for her to write her book. And I'm she I don't know how long it took for her to write the book, but um it, it's a perfect time for her to release it. All right. Our chances of nuclear war have increased for two main reasons. One, we don't have wise people at the helm like we did during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we have these three theaters that are boiling over. The European theater, the Middle Eastern theater, and the Asian theater. Now, most likely, the European or the Middle Eastern theater would have this tactical nuke go off, all right? Now, with a low-yield weapon, then you're going to have destruction. But then the question is, what will uh, the, the adversary do? What will the allied forces for that you know, for that country that was attacked by the tactical nuke, how are they going to respond, right? So let's say in the case of Ukraine and Russia, if Russia used a tactical nuke in Ukraine, how would NATO respond? Because we're talking lower yield than what she's talking about. These ICBMs are high yield or can be high yield, all right? Now, with that event then there's this game theory that's starting to take place you know do you how do you respond right if it if there was a if it was some sort of IC, icbm towards the united states then you're talking about rapid destruction of the world armageddon right but when you're talking about a tactical new in a certain theater where there is some sort of proxy war that's happening between the United States and Russia, that calculation is a little different. And once you break, once you break that, that deterrence of even using tactical nukes, then this thing will escalate or more tactical nukes potentially could be used and then eventually ICBMs. So I think there's two scenarios here playing out. ICBM scenario, destruction within, measured in minutes of the world, right? Tactical nukes, destruction may be measured in days because eventually those tactical nukes will, that potentially if it's going back and forth, 
then you're talking about IC, eventually ICBMs. Most likely, um, the other the other uh, issue is the is ha having some sort of EMP that goes off in combination with tactical nukes, knockout capability of Western powers to launch and you then start using tactical nukes in, in, in you know, the battle space. You know, I don't know how, how protected our nuclear systems are from an EMP. I would think that we would have to rely on our Navy then um, if an EMP took place. I think that the the um, the subs would be our major defense then. But it's it's it you know when you think about this it get, gets scary. You know we were we didn't have Armageddon in the nineteen in 1962, 1961 whenever Cuban Missile Crisis I think it was sixty one um, maybe it was sixty two probably sixty two I think it was um, because we had people that were wise. They fought in World War II and they were wise. And you had a president who was wi willing to question the generals, you know, and uh, try to find a better way, right? And had a partner on the other side that was willing to, to listen, all right? Khrushchev. We don't have that today. We don't have that today. We don't have people that are wise or listening. And it's scary. It's really scary. So, it's so, automatic, so, which is why the common frame. So back to my main reason why I was interjecting here. So she is writing a book to inform the public about these dangers. All right. But also, I don't hear a whole lot about her create how the national security state with their posturing against Russia since the fall of the Berlin Wall and this never-ending mentality of the Cold War in the think tanks precipitated this problem. The national security state caused this problem. Is, um, in Washington, is there's no such thing as a limited nuclear war. It really is. And then when you couple that with the idea of what, what's called sole presidential authority. So in the United States, we also have a policy that the president of the United States launches the counterattack. He doesn't ask permission of anyone, not the Secretary of Defense, not the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and certainly not the Congress. And so you begin to see, hopefully I demonstrate to readers like, whoa, this is all set up for mass extinction events. I mean, it's, it's sort of fascinating and terrifying, exactly yeah. as you articulated at the start of this. Yeah. I'm just trying so to get my roll head out head. Annie, roll out Annie with her with her book, which I think it is probably worth reading. I haven't read it, but I probably will read it. Um, but during the election, see, she's not talking about the national security state and their failures. She's not talking about how the world powers should have reduced nuclear weapons to zero. Why we haven't done that, I don't know. And, well, I do know, the national security state loves war, but, and money, right? But for the survival of mankind, we should not have nuclear weapons. And then you have the election in the United States and they're gonna spin it in the news like they did during during Trump's administration and during the, the first presidential election that Trump ran when he ran against Hillary Clinton, the psychologists and the psychiatrists were demonizing Trump, saying that he was a loose cannon and that he would generate nuclear war. Well, 
I think the data is suggesting that perhaps the Democratic Party has a higher propensity for nuclear war than the Trump administration, even a future Trump administration, all right? So, but they'll try to demonize Trump. Watch, watch in the news. They're gonna to start to try to, there's a loose cannon and this whole nuclear issue with Putin. We need someone that is rational. And that the Democratic Party is the rational actor. Really? Let's see, of who <laughs> starts one of these wars, knowing how it ends, the, you know, the, unless you're talking about a complete idiot or a lunatic in charge of a, a country that has these weapons. And I don't think, at the moment, I don't see any of the leaders of Russia, China, or America qualifying as either an idiot or a complete lunatic. But in Putin's case, mm -hmm. he's clearly shown himself to be an aggressive warmonger with the invasion of Ukraine. He's saber-rattled mm -hmm. more than I can remember any world leader doing about his nuclear capability. Um, is it possible, is it feasible, that he would see any logical reason to start one, knowing surely how it would end? In other words, are his threats... Yeah. The oh, national exactly. security state, the national security state thinks that Putin won't push the button and they'll keep on pushing and pushing and pushing towards the very boundaries of Russia to try to fat fracture it and literally take the resources of Russia and, and you know, make it a failed state. That's been, the, that's been the, the national security plan since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And they had this hubris right after the Gulf War in, in early 90s that all this stealth capability, right, was so much farther advanced than anything that Russia had. And that we just became a major superpower with no one to check our power at all. And that was a problem. That was a big problem. And we're still living through that 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 shockwave of decisions. The national security state is playing a dangerous game because if this stuff didn't happen, if they didn't do this stuff early on, we wouldn't have had the Putin that we have today. Now we got to deal with the Putin that we have today. Now, how do you de-escalate it? If there was a, a JFK in the room, right? How would JFK de-escalate it? Probably where you have to pull back on NATO. So Russia pulls back. Just like they pulled away their missiles in Cuba, we pulled away our missiles in, in Europe. Well, I would certainly hope they're hollow, but the problem is, you know, you have him speaking on the record about the possibility of nuclear use. And so, and again, what he's talking about are tactical nuclear weapons, at least as far as we can discern. What, what is that? Saying. Andy, just to be clear, what is a tactical okay. nuclear weapon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Tactical nuclear weapons are essentially just like armor, you know, bigger bombs on the battlefield versus the sort of euphemism of strategic nuclear weapons, which means ballistic missiles. So a ballistic missile gets from continent to continent in about 30 minutes. That's why we have the launch on warning policy. And so deterrence is essentially set up with this idea of ballistic missiles aimed at one another across the country, you know, across the world. Tactical nuclear weapons is essentially the fear that that is what Putin is considering using in Ukraine. And again, no matter what way you think about nuclear weapons, we know from these declassified scenarios and from all of my interviews with countless people who have been responsible for these plans and advising the president across decades that no matter how it starts, it ends. So to your point, like, yes, he's threatening 
tactical nuclear weapons, but any nuclear weapon is a really bad idea. Was it a great shame for the people of Ukraine that they gave up voluntarily their nuclear capability? I mean, do you think that Putin would have ever thought about invading Crimea, let alone uh, yeah. larger swathes of Ukraine two years mm -hmm. ago? So the historian in me takes a little bit of a different approach there. I interviewed former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, who was responsible for a lot of the sort of non-proliferation when the wall came down. And Ukraine had nuclear weapons positioned on their soil, but they would never have really been able to use them. The, co the command and control of those weapons was always in Moscow. And so what would they do with nuclear weapons that they couldn't launch? I'm not, I'm not sure, but you know, it is interesting to think about. It's frightening to think about. I think that's where my mind goes toward, let's listen to the people who are very skilled at these non-proliferation ideas, these organizations that are dedicated to that, because you basically wanna have sort of we as the people of the earth want to have less nuclear weapons and certainly less nuclear armed nations. What, what, we've had incidences over the past decades of mm -hmm. very near misses. I had to do a commercial for PNN. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the lozenges and the drops. I have elderberry lozenges, elderberry zinc lozenges and a 21 count. I have honey and lemon and blueberry lozen, uh, drops that are in a hundred count. And I also have manuka honey in a 21 count lozenges. So please go to the store, get the lozenges and the drops to soothe your throat, to neutralize pathogens because it has the structural nano silver. We're going into the allergy season in the United States. So there's going to be pollen and stuff you know, during the spring. So this will help you get through that. In addition, I also have these applicators that you can get from my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. So you have a spray bottle you, in this three pack. You, get, you have a spray bottle, you have a dropper, and you also have a nasal spray. So you can put, um, you can put the structural nano silver liquid in this and you can either you know use it as a spray or uh, a, a nasal spray or a dropper so please go to the store and get the applicator in addition i also have structural nano silver soaps i have many different varieties but some of the varieties is oatmeal spice lavender and peppermint so please go to the store and get the structural nano silver soaps to neutralize pathogens. It's a high quality soap. Get a couple bars for your, your household. And that helps to support my work and helps to improve your health. In terms of mis you know, mistakes being made and so on, given the unbelievable power of the modern day nuclear weapon, just immeasurably more powerful than anything the world has seen actually used. What is the what is the the danger of a simple human error unleashing one of these things and it being irrevocable? Yeah. I mean, there have been five or Pierce, it's really simple. Low probability, but extremely, extremely devastating. It's called a black swan, super fat tail event. And that's why we should eliminate nuclear weapons. And oh, by the way, eliminate the national security fucking state. Miscalculations, near nuclear misses on the record that we know about. And I write about some of them very briefly in the book. You know, it's just shocking to think that you could come close to nuclear war, come really close. And again, that has to do with the seconds and hours in which things unfold. Again, it was Secretary of former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, Perry who told me the most haunting specific example of that because he was involved in it. And as, a, as an investigative journalist who writes books, 
I really get a lot of value out of listening to people who are at the center of the event talk about it. Because I'm always interested in like that human feeling behind it. Yeah. And when Perry was describing to me what it was like back in 1979, um, he was the deputy secretary, deputy secretary director of uh, research and engineering at the Pentagon. And he was the night watch guy that got this message, you know, the nuclear night watch guy. He got the message from both the bunker beneath the Pentagon and the STRATCOM bunker beneath Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Both of them saying that the Russians had launched ballistic missiles, something like a thousand of them at the United States from submarines and from silos. And so Perry described it going through his mind for a few minutes, how he was gonna brief the president that he needed to launch a counterattack. And it was just a few seconds later that he was notified that, are you ready for this? It was a training tape, like a VHS tape that had been mistakenly inserted into a machine beneath the oh, Pentagon. God, you see, you see, so my, look, obviously I'm horrified by that little detail, but also what mm -hmm. safeguards are in place today to not let that happen? This is why the national security state is out of control. Now they can do something nefarious on purpose that leads to war and destruction or by accident because they're fucking stupid. Again, given how close that must have been to unleashing the war that you believe, and I can understand why you do, um, would end everything. Right. I mean, nothing hit me harder in reporting and writing this book that the nuclear command and control system in the United States is a system. And what that means is it's a system of machines. Mm -hmm people and machines and all machines break and when you think about that that idea of you know that we really are one misunderstanding one miscalculation one technical error away from nuclear armageddon that is astonishing well it's it's horrifying isn't it um tell me about the because i know you talk about this in your book the sheer power of one of these new nuclear weapons. Um, I mean, what would it be like to be underneath one of these things when it landed? Yeah. I mean, that's why I begin the book with a one megaton thermonuclear bomb striking the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And that's because everyone in Washington, D.C., is terrified of what's called a bolt out of the blue attack. And that's an unwarned nuclear attack against Washington. And to your point, like I think people after reading the book would certainly hope they were at the center point when a nuclear weapon, were a nuclear weapon to strike because you would just turn into combusting carbon and it would be a lot easier than what, what happens to the individuals outside ground zero right so ground zero is a one mile diameter ring of fire it obliterates everything in that ring and then you have the rings going out where you have you know the most horrific things happening as you know engineered structures change shapes and sort of concrete glass apart and the streets turn into molten lava the descriptions by the way come not from annie jacobson's imagination but rather from Defense Department documents. Because defense scientists have been studying the effects of nuclear weapons on people and on things since the end of World War II. And what about the, the sort of fabled winter that comes after a nuclear explosion? Yeah. How does yeah. that manifest itself? What would that be like to, mm -hmm. to live through? Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, that is not a fable. Nuclear winter is an absolute phenomenon. And when it was first written about in 1983, the five authors, one of whom was Carl Sagan, the famous American scientist, 
Um, you know, this idea that the soot rising up from the mega fires after the nuclear explosions would blot out the sun and create a nuclear winter was initially discounted by the Defense Department as Soviet propaganda. And the authors of that nuclear winter theory, one of whom I interview at great length for my book, Professor Brian Toon, he was Carl Sagan's student at the time. Um, you know, he was explaining to me that those authors, humble as they were, uh, sort of conceded that their modeling capabilities were limited. Of course, in 1983, you didn't have the computer systems that you have now. But since then, Toon and others have been dedicated to really drilling down on the nuclear winter theory using state-of-the-art computers. And what they have found is that actually what they initially reported was nothing compared to what nuclear winter would really be like. And this is, again, based on computer models today. So you're talking about parts of the Earth dropping 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I don't have the Celsius. Um, and you're talking about the mid-latitudes being under all the freshwater bodies being under sheets of ice. And so you'd have agriculture fail. Without agriculture, people starve to death. And this is where really that idea, uh, a quote from Nikita Khrushchev, where he said, after a nuclear war, the survivors would envy the dead. Wow. Yeah, I remember that quote. It's a very it's forbidding cool. quote when you have talked to someone like you <laughs> for half an hour, Annie, I've mm -hmm. got to say. Um, is it true that there are nuclear bunkers for the great and good, the powerful, which would withstand uh, a nuclear war, a proper all-out one, or would everything just go? Mm -hmm. So that, I would borrow your word, fable, right? That is a fantasy, you know? Um, even the Stratcom bunker isn't going to survive. Even the Raven Rock bunker, which is officially called the alternate National Military Command Center bunker, that wouldn't survive. Um, you know, I did an interview with uh, the former FEMA director. That's the agency in the United States that's in charge of population protection planning after, let's say, earthquakes, fires, flood. Well, they're also in charge of planning for a nuclear war. And Craig Fugate, I interviewed, he was the FEMA director for eight years. I've interviewed him. I mean, what he said, you've interviewed him, okay. Several times. And during, what he actually, said, when I was at CNN during, during natural disasters, he'd always be, he'd always be out there. Yeah. Okay, well, you have to get him on your show. Yeah to tell your audience about nuclear war. Because what he said shocked me. I even went back to him and said, like, are, are you sure that you actually said all this on the record? Um, you know, he described uh, nuclear war as what is called a low probability, high consequence event. Really? And he likened it to an asteroid strike. And by the way, FEMA prepares for asteroid strikes and they prepare for nuclear war. And what he told me was that, you know, there would be no protection planning of the people. You know um, what is amazing to me, after, you know, and this, this is with the crisis that we went through in 2020, uh, the aftershock with cancers and, and everything, you know, I am so surprised at how stupid people are, right? And I don't know if it's because of technology and they're just getting dumbed down, I'm coming from a generation that maybe straddled, you know, uh, you know, tech, uh, you know, the computer and, you know, pre-computer age, right? I don't know, but I'll tell you, there's an awful lot of people out there that are just, they don't have wisdom and they're stupid. And these things that she just said were major topics of discussion in the 1980s. It's almost like we have to revisit it and all the problems because one, we have worse leaders now, less knowledgeable, with less wisdom, and we have a population that has been dumbed down. Nuclear war, everyone would be dead. Really? And then he described to me as FEMA director how he would have to deal with this kind of thing from a bunker 
you know, where he would be whisked away to a place called Mount Weather. And he was describing to me how he would have to like disassociate himself from the horror because he knew there would be nothing that FEMA could do for anyone after a nuclear war. And it would really be about, and here's his quote, self-survive. Mm. Incredible. Did you watch Oppenheimer? Mm -hmm. I did, I did, I did. And I was really, you know, I, I'm a big fan of films. Um, I'm a big fan of storytelling in general. And I think that any amount of, you know, manner in which you can get people to become interested in a subject matter, where you can kind of reduce or get rid of this idea of like, oh, that's a subject that you aren't equipped to know about, which is kind of a common thread when it comes to, you know, a lot of people with PhDs, shall we say. Um, and so if you can bring the story to the people, then I feel like there is hope. I once interviewed Professor Stephen Hawking shortly before he died, it turned out to be his last mm -hmm. television interview, and I asked him, you know, actually he thought the biggest threat to mankind uh, was artificial intelligence if it learned how to self-design. Yeah. Of course, the first thing that AA may, might do if it does learn to self-design is unleash nuclear weapons to kill all the dismal, uh, inferior humans. So I think he, he probably was morphing the two things together. But I said to him, if you if you knew it was your last day on Earth and you were about to, everyone was about to die, how would you spend it? And he said he would be with his family, mm. drinking champagne in the sunshine, listening to Wagner. And so, Annie, after this apocalyptic interview, I, I just want to ask you, how would you, if you knew the nuclear Armageddon mm -hmm. was coming, how would you spend your last day? Okay, so not to deflect the question, but I, I am a little more hopeful than that, right? Because even though I wrote this book, which is just terrifying, is. Um, I, 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 I believe there actually is hope. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference here the, what I call the Reagan reversal, okay? Um, when I was a young high school student in 1983, there was an ABC miniseries called The Day After. Mm -hmm. And it was so controversial and so scary and so doom and gloom that uh, the ABC executives were actually encouraged not to air it, mm -hmm. but they did. And a hundred million Americans watched mm -hmm. The Day After, including a very important American named President Reagan. And he even wrote in his journal, his presidential journal, that he became greatly depressed watching it. But here's the hopeful part. He reached out to his Russian counterpart, Gorbachev. They had communications that led to the Reykjavik summit. And as a result, the world went from the all-time high. There were 70,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. Do you believe in synchronicity? Do you believe in strange alignments? All right? It's not... How should I phrase this? I think it is very odd and metaphysical that we're hearing about Reykjavik Summit. Do you find it odd that you uh, listen to me and... You know, I have a website called The Studio Reykjavik. Do you find it odd that there is volcanic eruptions that are going on in the middle of this cr the crazy times that we're in, in Reykjavik? Perhaps it's time to start listening to Dr. Paul Cottrell a lot more often. And now, today, there are around 12,500. You could say that's 12,500 too many, but it is progress. If you're wrong with your hope and the apocalyptic nature mm -hmm. of your book comes to fruition, I'll just repeat my question. You've got a few hours, Annie. How are you going to spend it? Mm -hmm. I get in the car and go skiing. <laughs> Any particular slopes? Yeah, I go to Mammoth, where, you know, right, I live in LA and Mammoth Mountain has amazing skiing and I go there all the time and you know, Mother Nature. <laughs> that sounds a pretty good way. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard someone say. The thing that you would probably do isn't wasting your time. It's actually 
realizing that you're going to die and that whatever you've done that's good and whatever you've done that's bad is going to be judged. And so you'll probably have some sort of prayer. Now, Jews would probably say the Shema. The Christians would probably say something similar. I don't know what it is, but they probably would have something. And I'm sure Muslims would do the same. The last thing you're going to be doing is drinking champagne and listening to classical music or going skiing. to end your life, that's how it ever happens. Uh, and it's been a fascinating mm -hmm. conversation about a subject I think that we all think we know about, but really, without reading your book and, and talking to you, I feel like I was not even a first base of knowledge about uh, the, the reality of a nuclear war. And let's just hope and pray we never, ever have to see it. In fact, if we did, well, this would be a superfluous conversation. We wouldn't be here to discuss it. Uh, Annie Jacobson, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Help support my work so I can inform you based on what's going on in the world, my perspective, which I think it's unique. I'm not the only one that has, you know, similar thoughts, but I think that I give you something to chew on in terms of knowledge and wisdom. Unlike Dr. Malone and Dr. McCall. <laughs> don't have any original thought, any. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the all natural deodorants that I have um, worked with uh, Gail from Rainbow Herbals. We partnered up and, and we created this, this uh, very high quality deodorant. You can get it in citrus and you can get it in peppermint, tea tree and lavender. It's for males and females, and it's made from essential oils from the Himalayas, very high quality. And not only would you be using it every day for a deodorant, but it helps to detox the body because of the, because of the ingredients. So please go to the store, get a couple bars of this, and you're going to be happy that you did because of the high quality of the deodorant and the dual capability. I believe in pro providing products to my audience on my store, the-studio-reykvik.com that has dual purpose. Not everything has dual purpose, but many do. So thank you for listening. Please make sure that you subscribe to my channels. Make sure you go to the store, the-studio-reykvik.com to get the supplements that I just mentioned, get the eBooks that I have, and also sign up for the lectures that, that I publish. You can sign up for immunology and pulmonology lectures. All you have to do is pay 50 bucks for each module, you know, 50 bucks for 22 lectures for pulmonology and um, uh, $50 and you get 16 lectures actually for immunology. So please go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and help support my work. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.